Well, good morning. It is very good to be here. Yes, I see lots of familiar faces. Um, my dear Ruskies. <laughs> yeah, I really do. I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm sorry it was for the situation it was, Timothy. We are praying for you and your family with you. And so we'll trust God will use it for his glory, yeah? Yeah. Um, the text, the, 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 not the text, but the message that I have this morning is something that I've been studying on and off and, and since the summertime. And it's something that is, is in my being. And so it, it's becoming a very favorite topic, very favorite perspective. And I, I, the title that I would give this, if there is such a thing, is Imitating Christ in a World Filled with Suffering. Imitating Christ in a World Filled with Suffering. And I'll have numerous texts. I'm basically going to see his, the, 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 the mercy of God towards those who are physically suffering and spiritually suffering. And we're just going to see this through the breadth of Scripture. And I hope by the time we're done this morning, we will see that this is a primary attribute of God, not exclusive attribute, but primary attribute of God is that he is merciful and compassionate, and we who know him are to emulate that. We are to imitate that. And so the more you and I become like Christ, the more merciful and compassionate we become toward those who are suffering, not only in our church, in our, in our fellowship, but the world needs a church that is more like Jesus Christ. So there is no debate, is there just... An introduction here that the world is filled with suffering very soon after Adam's fall recorded in Genesis 3 death has been the human experience sickness disease physical suffering emotional suffering is seen throughout history it is the human dilemma since the fall and in addition the human soul has been separated from the Creator enslaved to sin, under its tyranny, suffering the consequences of being an enemy of God. There's no peace, no lasting joy, anxieties, distress, the fear of death, under the sway of the evil one, oppressed by the darkness. That is the human dilemma because of the fall. And in a word, we could sum it up as suffering. The human experience since the fall and the result of the fall is one of suffering, sadness, and sorrow. Today, as we look out over our nation, look at our neighbors, the upheaval brought about by the political situation, by this, this virus, there's fear, there's anxieties, there's sadness, there's physical suffering, there's mental spiritual suffering, people are isolated, lonely, with no hope, drug abuse, they tell us, is on the increase, alcohol abuse is off the charts, child abuse, divorce rate is growing, suicides, so sad, suicides are on the increase, in a word, it's suffering. The world is suffering. Christians are suffering. This is the condition where the Lord has us, though. This is where he has his church in a world of suffering. You and I, as his redeemed people, are his representatives in this place amongst people who are paralyzed by fear. They're paralyzed of getting sick. They're paralyzed of dying. They're paralyzed with fear of the unknown. Our beloved Lord in Matthew 9, as he looked out over the masses, he says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. 
our Lord looked out on a very similar world as the one we look at on. This world of hopeless sufferers will not find what it needs in human government. It will not find relief in psychology. It will not find relief in psychiatry or drugs or any other substance. Of course, we know this. Their only hope is Jesus Christ. To come to him, to surrender to him. We who know him personally have experienced the joy and the peace that only he can give. We have tasted of him, as it says in 1 Peter 2, and we have found him to be good. We are here in this place at this time by his sovereign hand. And we are here not only to represent him, but to show him, to reflect him to a world of suffering. Christians are here living in the, in, amongst the unconverted, not only to speak his word, but to live his life, to do and to act as he did, as he does, to have his attitudes, especially toward those who are suffering. Christians give a visual to the world of the invisible. Do you realize that? You and I are a visual of the invisible. When they look to the church, they see the body of Christ. It is a visual of the invisible. When they look to us, they see Christ. They see God. Isn't that what Jesus said to Philip? When Philip said, show us the Father, and that'll be good enough. And Jesus says, I've, have I been with you for so long, and yet you still ask me to show me the Father? He says, if you have seen me, you've seen who? The Father. To look on Christ is to see the Father. To look on Christ in his incarnation is to see the invisible. You see, the church is an extension of Christ's ministry. We are his body. We are carrying out what he began in the power of the Holy Spirit, you see. We, like Christ, live amongst the suffering, and we are to show the invisible. And when we do, they see compassion. They see divine mercy. Amen? Amen. Hello. <laughs> Somebody's calling. <laughs> they must need mercy. <laughs> God is sovereign. Somebody's got them on the phone and caused them to call us. But we give visible to the invisible, yes? Listen to some of these verses, please. This is a lengthy introduction. But I will be done on time, I'm sure. <laughs> Galatians 4.19. Just listen to this. Paul says to his struggling Galatians who are going back and forth with grace and legalism, he says, My children, with whom I am again in labor... Until Christ is formed in you, Galatians 4.19. He says, I'm gonna, I have to re-minister re, re to you the grace of God until Christ is formed in you. Christ is formed in you. What an interesting phrase. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ, what? Lives, present tense, in me. Present tense. Every Christian is indwelt by Christ through the Holy Spirit and is actively living out the life of Christ. Christ lives in me. Listen to Ephesians 4.13. Listen to this. The, the goal of pastoral ministry in Ephesians 4 verse 13 says this, that, we, that pastor teachers are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's verse 12. Verse 13, until, goal, we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. In other words, pastoral ministry is working very hard through the, through the, through the teaching of the Word of God for the saints of God to become more and more like Jesus Christ, to take on the stature the, the visual of the invisible. That's why God saved us and left us here. 
He could have taken us to glory the moment he saved you. But he left you here. Why? To become more like his son and to show his son in a world of suffering that they might see Christ. I don't know about you, but I like getting up in the morning with a purpose. I hate wondering what I'm going to (laughs) do. Right? But since God saved me, I have a purpose. And that's to show his son everywhere I go, to the market, to the daycare, to school, to church, to people who are under the bridge suffering. I want to go there and show them Jesus Christ. You see, that's what Christ did. He came here for that. How about Romans 8, 29? It's, we were predestined. I love that word. Don't we? Yes, we love predestination because it's in the Bible and it is a work of God. So get over it if you don't like it. It's in your Bible, (laughs) right? I've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God predestined that. So putting all that together so far, we then, as Christians, are redeemed Christ is in us. Christ is coming and conforming us more each and every day by the power of the Spirit. The process of sanctification is to become like Jesus Christ in my character, in my attitudes. The more I become like Christ, the more I love you like Christ loves you. Doesn't that make you happy? Yeah. I like hanging around people who are like Jesus because I know I'll be loved. (laughs) (laughs) right that's the church but my focus today here is imitating Christ in a world that is suffering imitating Christ we're predestined to this conformity beloved since conversion God has been transforming our inner person more and more into the very likeness of Jesus as we take on his image as we take on his character Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we are new creatures in Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed from glory to glory. That glory is this, is the characteristic, is the attributes of God. It's the attributes of Christ. It's Christ's likeness. His glory is his radiant perfection. It's who he is, see? And as we behold his glory, we, by the power of the Spirit, are being changed to the very glory that we're gazing upon. And where is it that you gaze upon the glory of the Lord is the scriptures. God is revealed on the pages of scripture. And as you behold Jesus Christ, as you study him, as you read the gospels and follow him along in your sanctified imagination, as you follow him in the gospels, you're being conformed to the very image that you're following. So the more time you and I spend with Christ through the scriptures, the more we become like him. And the more we become like him is we become more merciful. We become more compassionate. We become more loving, imitating Christ in a world of suffering. That sounds like, that sounds like, that sounds like a ministry. That sounds like what the church is to be doing. The church is not to be, anyway, I'll leave that alone. (laughs) Stay on track, Tony. Stay on track. Look at me, right? (laughs) Look at me, stay focused, right? Listen, the scriptures not only say that we are being conformed and transformed to the image of Christ, the scriptures exhort us numerous times to imitate him, to follow in his steps, to walk as he did, to follow his pattern, to follow his example. Listen to 1 John 2, 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. We're to walk in his steps. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, the Apostle Paul says it like this. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So then that would be to say, to look at Paul, the Corinthians, as they looked at Paul, they would be seeing an example, a manifestation of Christ. 
Can people say that of us? Can I say with true honesty? It's almost embarrassing, isn't it? Almost reluctant. We imitate me as I imitate Christ. We should all be able to say that because as I imitate Christ. Don't imitate me in everything, but imitate me as I imitate Christ. You see? Of course, Paul's not saying he's perfect. Either are you and I saying we are perfect, but imitate me as I imitate Christ. I'm being conformed to the likeness of Christ. I'm being exhorted to, to follow his pattern, his example. That brings us to our subject today, imitating Christ in a world of suffering towards those who physically suffer, those who are emotionally, spiritually suffering. With this new nature and imitating Christ, just what does it look like? Well, we can't imitate his omnipotence. We can't imitate, imitate his omniscience. We see Jesus in the Gospels. We see the God-man living amongst the suffering and the sinners. And as we follow him in the Gospels, what is it that we see? What attribute comes to the surface? What comes to your mind when I ask you, based on your exposure to the Gospels, what is Christ like? Harsh, judgmental, legalistic. Is that your view of Christ? Of course it isn't. What is it? Compassionate. First thing out of your lips. First thing out of my mind without even really thinking. The exposure from the Gospels is that Jesus was merciful. He was compassionate. Well, the primary characteristic we see that I'm going to put forth here that we are to imitate is compassion and mercy. Compassion, what does that mean? It means to share in the suffering, to share in the suffering. Compassion, right? To share in the suffering of others and be moved to alleviate them. Compassion is to enter into the suffering of others and then to be moved to alleviate the cause of their suffering. That's compassion. It's not, boy, be warm and be filled, and then go do something else, right? No, it's to see suffering, and then compassion moves me into that person's life to alleviate, which is bringing about the suffering. That's compassion. In the Gospels, we hear often, how many times do you hear this? Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And what does Jesus do? Be still. I don't have time for you. I'm heading towards the cross. No. Of course he had mercy. He would often stop and say, what would you like me to do for you? Jesus would say, what would you like me to do for you? I would like my sight. And he gives him his sight. Christ is, is so glorious. <laughs> we want to be like him. Yes. Yes. I'm fascinated by the fact, think of this, please. By the way, Timothy, I, I knew I should ask this. When am I finished? When am I finished? What time? Oh, oh praise God. <laughs> it's a church that likes preaching. <laughs> um, I'm fascinated by the fact that Jesus came in his first coming his incarnation to reveal God the Father, okay? Among other things, he came to reveal God the Father, to show the Israelites Yahweh. That's, what, that's why he came, not exclusively, obviously. He came to redeem, but he came to show God, okay? As we already asked, when Philip asked Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus, already, Jesus said in 14.9, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, okay? Now, in John 1.1, 1, 1, we should probably turn there because you're going to think I'm making all this stuff up. Go to John 1. Verse 1, very famous verse, and we'll, we'll, we'll skip on down to some other verses. But think of this. This is Jesus coming in his first coming. He says, in the beginning, 1.1, 1, 1, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, so at least we can say this, that the verse 1 is saying that the Word is God, yeah? 
The word was God. You go down to verse 14, please, and then you see this. And the word became flesh. So the word which was God in verse 1 became that which it was not previously and became flesh. And notice, dwelt among us, tabernac tabernacled among us, pitched its tent among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so thus far, the word which is God in verse 1, verse 14 says this, God became flesh, incarnate, we and tabernacled in our midst, and we saw, we beheld his glory. Okay, all right. So the divine one took on humanity, was amongst us, and we beheld his radiant perfections, his glory. As he goes on to say here, full of grace and truth. If you skip over, please, to verse 18. Look at verse 18. No one has seen God at any time, invisible. The only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father, who's that? Jesus, the Son, second person of the Trinity, the Word become flesh. He made known. He explained the one who's invisible. You see? So Christ came to reveal, to make known the invisible God. So to see Jesus is to see Yahweh, okay? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he's full of glory, full of grace. And the glory that he's speaking about is grace and truth, okay? Do you remember in Matthew 1, 21, when the angel came to Gabriel and said that your wife, hey, don't throw her out, she, she's the conceptions by the, the Holy Spirit, you, she will have a son and you will name him Emmanuel. Why did they call, why did they call him Emmanuel? God with us. Yes? God with us. So we know this, but please get this. God became a man, and what is it that we see about God. What is it that the God man wanted to reveal to us about himself? Is that he's full of compassion, he's full of mercy, he's full of grace, he's full of faithfulness. Yeah? Amen. And if I'm being conformed to the very image, you know what? I'm becoming more graceful more gracious, I'm becoming more merciful, I'm becoming more compassionate if I'm, be if I'm being conformed to his image, you see? All right. Now this glory, this radiant glory that Jesus came to reflect, can I take you back to Exodus 34? Exodus 34 And look at verses 5 and 6. And if you remember, this is God's response to Moses when Moses requested to see his glory. And God said to Moses, I will tuck you in the cleft of the rock. Okay, that's the end of 33. You come into chapter 34, look at verses 5 and 6. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him. As he called upon the name of the Lord, verse 6, please notice. Then the Lord passed by in front of him. And what's the next word? And proclaimed. He didn't do anything. He preached. God preached. And what did he preach? The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and truth. And then verse 7. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands. And forgives iniquity and transgression. And sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He's not, he's not, he's not unrighteous. But he is merciful. My, my, what I want you to gather from this. This is God's response to Moses. When Moses asked him. Show me your glory. And God didn't go on the mountain and make earthquakes. He didn't make, he didn't make the sun go out. He didn't show his power. He didn't show his omniscience. He showed his mercy. So God tells us 
that his glory that he wants us to, to know and to gaze upon is that he is compassionate, slow to anger, forgiving. Jesus then, when he comes in his incarnation to show Yahweh, it is not, it is not something new. The Old Testament God is not the mean God, and Jesus is the nice God, as so many foolish people say, out of ignorance. But the, you read Psalm 103, which talked nothing about, talked about everything about mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and pardon. That's Yahweh talking. King David says this. In in Psalm 51, verse 1, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. King David, he's not uh, someone you want to take home, I don't think. I'd rather have Jesus in my house, not King David. King David had Uriah killed. That boils my blood as one of his faithful soldiers committed adultery, I'm more like David than I am like Jesus. Amen? And so are you. And we need a God of compassion. And those who have experienced compassion, those who are being conformed to the likeness of a compassionate God, we show compassion to others. We don't cut them off at the knees and throw them out. We don't step on their neck because they sinned. We go and pick them up. We brush them off, just like Jesus. The church needs to be like Christ. And to be like Christ is to be full of compassion, full of mercy towards sinners. Amen? Amen. The world needs that, beloved. You know that. I know that. I want, I want to hang out with people who are merciful, <laughs> right? The self-righteous people, I just soon avoid them. They scare me to death because I never can meet their standards. And I can't, and you never know when the next whack is coming at the back of your head. We want to hang out with people who are merciful, who have needed grace, have experienced grace, and show grace. That's to be like Christ. That's to be like God. That's to that's that's the goal of redemption. That's the goal of salvation, is to make me like him. And if I'm becoming like him, I'm becoming more compassionate. Amen? Amen. Amen. So then, this great text of Exodus 34, 6, God is revealing that this is his character. This is his glory. This is his glory. When he says, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. This is his glory. And this is repeated throughout the Old Testament. In fact, Jonah for the sake of time, we won't go there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope that you remember Jonah. When he, why did he not go to Nineveh to preach what God had him to preach? Is because he knew God was compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and would forgive the Ninevites. Right? I knew this is your character. Chapter 4, Jonah says to God, I knew you would do this. <laughs> I knew you would forgive them if they repented. And I didn't, want, I didn't want you to have mercy on them, right? The reluctant, the reluctant missionary, <laughs> right? He knew the character of God. He knew this text, and he knew God's character. And he knew that if the Ninevites repented, God would have mercy on them, you see? That's God's character. Jesus comes to show that. Think of this. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.13, this is nothing new. He says of God the Father, he calls him the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1.3. The God of the Old Testament is revealed in, in the God of the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ. And what is it that we see that the God of the Old Testament that's revealed in Jesus Christ in his incarnation is the same, and that is that he is compassionate, merciful, slow to anger. Abounding in loving kindness. This is the God of the Bible. This is the one who saved us. This is the one we're becoming more like. Can I take you to Matthew 12, please? Matthew 12. 
And as I studied this and I keep studying this, I, I, this, this becomes a dominant, this, this, the, 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 the passages and the verses that support what I'm saying are growing. It's, just, it's really the whole Bible. It, this biblical theology <laughs> in, in an hour, <laughs> right? Um, Matthew 12, look at this. I just love this picture given here. Um, as soon as I get there, Matthew 12. This is the, the reed that's broken. The reed was used as a musical instrument by shepherds, okay? And along the, the marshes and the, and, the, and the creeks of Israel, these reeds would uh, grow in abundance. And so they would reach down there and cut, and they would make a little musical instrument out of this reed, okay? That would be like a flute, and as you put it in your mouth, you know, at first it's hard and rigid and you can make sound. But after use, it becomes kind of flimsy like a straw. And what do you do? You just throw it away and go get another one, right? Because he had so many of those reeds growing along the wetlands. But if you go to Matthew 12, look at what Jesus says here in quoting Isaiah when he does this. He says in verse 17 and following, notice, this was to fulfill, well, you know what, back up to 15, I'm sorry, 15. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all. 16, and he warned them not to tell who he was. 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and she, he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He's not arrogant. In other words, look at verse 20. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory, and in his names the Gentiles will hope. What is that picture in verse 20? Is, is the mercy of the Messiah. That a battered reed, a, a reed, it's not insignificant to the Messiah. And what does he say? A battered reed and a smoldering wick. People sometimes are useless to others. And those who are useless to society, they just throw them away. But Jesus doesn't do that. This is what the text is saying. The Messiah, that's his servant, he does not break off and discard that which no longer has use. Jesus takes the useless and gives them use. Jesus does not neglect them. Jesus does not abuse them. Jesus does not abandon them. He actually keeps them and restores them and makes them useful. A smoldering wick. What is a wick for? Maybe we're in a different generation and we're used to the light switches. But maybe like Jan and I, all of you guys, right? We had candles and, and, uh, and lanterns, right? And, and the wick from the oil and the wick, and you'd light it, and would light up your house. But after a while, it would start to burn and ash and smolder and become smoldering, no longer shedding light, no longer doing what it was supposed to do. So what do you do? You, you, cli you clip and clean up the wick so that the light comes back. You don't throw it. Jesus is saying here in verse 20, a smoldering wick, he will not snuff out. He actually gives it use. He actually restores it. What a great picture. The first century Israel would knew exactly what he's talking about. The Messiah doesn't throw us away. Sometimes the church throws us away. Sometimes society throws people away. Messiah doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't do that. You know why? Because he's full of compassion and mercy. Aren't you glad? I'm very often... A smoldering wick. I like to think of myself as a, as a blasting torch, but you know what? More often than not, I'm a smoldering wick, and Jesus doesn't throw me away. Isn't that great? Huh. The compassion of the Messiah reaches down even to the lowliest sinners. The physical misery and the, and the affliction does not go unnoticed by God. The physical blind, think of Jesus as he's walking. The leprosy. He didn't avoid lepers. He didn't avoid lepers. 
He was not indifferent or apathetic. He never rejected anybody's request. He never rejected them. He never turned away. He, even when he was exhausted from hours and even days of ministry, he never said, no, get back to me next week. Never. He always acted out of mercy. How did he treat sinners? Tax collectors? Harlots? Oh, he would never go where they were, would he? Would Jesus hang out with harlots? Shameful. Tax collectors? No, not those guys. Now think with me. Matthew 11. If you're in Matthew 12, back up to Matthew 11 and look at verse 19. Look at the accusation of the Pharisees of our Lord. Verse 19, do you see it there? Look what it says. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. He hung out so often, not to become like them, don't misinterpret, not to become a drunkard, right? Not to promote harlotry, but he hung out with those people so often that the Pharisees accused him in verse 19 of being one of them. Can that be said of us? Do we hang out with sinners? Have you forgotten where the Lord has brought you? Or were you born righteous? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Where else is the world going to see Christ? Where else is the world going to see the mercy of God? Is when Christians get in the midst of them. You see? I'm an in I and you are the incarnation of the invisible, just like Jesus Christ. We are an extension of the ministry of Jesus. He went where the sinners were so that he could show God to those who don't know him. Amen? Beloved, please, don't be so self-righteous that you avoid the needy. Don't become like them. Go in there to rescue them, <laughs> to show them Christ. Amen? That goes against a lot, a lot of church philosophy. A lot of churches won't do that. They like to be the frozen chosen. You know what happens to the frozen chosen? They stay frozen and they die. <laughs> and then nobody shows up on Sunday because they were so frozen and they died. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Amen? Amen, Ruskies. The world needs to see our Lord. And, they, and, and the, the Lord we need to show them is compassionate and merciful. Can I remind you? I think it would be good for us again. Can I take you to Matthew 8? I know Timothy's going to get you there eventually, but it's going to take him a while to go through the Sermon on the Mount, so I, I'm comfortable here. <laughs> Look at Matthew 8. I just want you to see this, and then we'll go to another passage and go to another passage. But look at our Lord. Just follow our Lord. It's so wonderful to do so. Verse 1, chapter 8. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Look at verse 3. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. You know what's amazing about that? How contagious is leprosy? That's why they had put him out of the camp. It was so contagious, and nobody wanted leprosy. Jesus Christ touched lepers. Can you think, think of me, think of me, please. Verse 3, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Don't miss that. We read this, we're so familiar with this. 
Do you, can you imagine being a leper? Read this from being a leper. Lepers were outside the camp, removed from their family, put in quarantine. <laughs> yes, you get what I, what I would like to say, but I won't. But the leper was cut off from all society. And nobody touched them. Didn't God make us to want to be touched and hugged, shake hands? Don't you like shaking hands? It's so sad today you go to the store and see an old friend. Oh, I can't. And he goes like this, you know. Get out of here. Shake my hand. Be a man. Right. <laughs> He's a Christian. What are you going to do? Die? That's so bad? You go to glory. I'm serious. Jesus, he didn't have to because often Jesus would heal with just a word. But Jesus had compassion on a leper so much that he would touch him to heal him. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. The perfect son of man understands humanity. He knows our needs, and he's willing to come down to our level, and he's willing to touch you. Are we willing to do the same? What a great opportunity the China virus has given us Christians to go into people's lives that the world would say, quarantine, unclean. We should be running in there trying to rescue them touching them. Can I bring you groceries? Can I do ministry for you? Can I serve you? Can I serve you? The unbelievers, think of this, the unbelievers who are so scared of this virus, wouldn't it be great if in Christians would come to their aid? Even if it's just a call. Even if it's just to deliver. Do you know what I'm saying? And maybe you already do that, and if you do, praise God. And if you do, let's do more. Let's do more. This is the point of what I'm trying to say. If God is like this, and he is, and Jesus is like this, and he is, is he no longer like that because he's in heaven? Or is he still this way? I think he's still this way, right? Because he was before incarnation. <laughs> he came incarnation, and now he's in exaltation. I think he's still like this. And if I'm being made in his image, I'm becoming like this too. And I should be intentional in finding people who need mercy. They need mercy. The greatest need of the world is for a faithful church to be like Christ. That's what the world needs. They don't need self-righteous speaking. They need gospel. They need gospel and the loving deeds that accompany the gospel. They need Christ-like compassion and mercy. Are you willing to put yourself in a dangerous situation for the sake of someone's need? Or are we so into our little cluster and we put a moat around our lives and our church so that it keeps the world out? No, fill up the moat with cement, right? And let's go out. Let them in. Let's go out. Show them Christ. Touch them like Christ. Have compassion like Christ. Be intentional in their lives. How can I bring Christ to that family? How can I bring Christ to that sufferer? I'm going down the street and I see someone in need. Do I just kind of do the Levite thing? I should be intentional. If I have time in my life and I say, boom, I need to go serve this guy. Is God sovereign? He is. And he lets you see that. <laughs> well, he's not that sovereign. Yes, he is. Think of all the opportunities, beloved. Don't miss them. Jesus never did. Jesus was never too busy for anybody. Was he? He was never too. Aren't you glad? When you, when you pleaded for mercy, when you repented for salvation, he wasn't too busy for you. Let's be like Jesus. 
Let's be like Jesus. Let's take the invisible down to them. We're the manifestation of Christ. But you want more? I do too. Look at this. Look at chapter, look at chapter uh, 9, just for skipping. Chapter 9 of Matthew, look at verse 1. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. That would be Capernaum, north of the Sea of Galilee. And they brought to him a paralytic on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes, look at how the scribes responded. Instead of rejoicing, instead of rejoicing in the mercy and the power of God, look what they say, as fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, what are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Wow. Go to Mark 7, please. Mark 7. Mark 7. One of my favorite verses here. Look at verse 31, Mark 7. Please. In the daily life of Christ, we follow him now, and he's going in verse 31. Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through the Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. 32. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hands on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself, put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva, 34, and looking up to heaven with a deep sigh. A deep sigh. Why was there a deep sigh? The angst in the perfect son of man over what sin has done to one of his creatures, man. A deep sigh. He said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. I know we know this. I know we've read this. But can you read it from the guy who's being touched? Can you read it from the man who's being healed? And can you see the mercy of God in this? This is a very insignificant person to the rest of the world like you and me, and yet the Son of Man took time to heal him. Yeah? Praise God, man. Go back in chapter 7 of this. Um, go Actually, go to Luke 7, please. Luke 7. Luke 7. So glorious. Luke chapter 7. And if you looked at verse 11, I believe, I love this. Oh, man. Look at this. Verse 11, soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Verse 12, now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. So do you see the details given there? This lady had had lost her husband, and now her only son has just died. And in the culture, this lady has no hope of anything but begging. Okay, So her life became very, very difficult right now that her son had died. Okay, In the culture. She, all now she can do is beg. Her, but think of this. Jesus comes, happens upon this city and this funeral that's carrying the dead man in the coffin. Verse 13, what moved our Lord? Compassion. There's that word again. Splankna. Deep down internal stuff. It's so, it's so graphic, beloved. It's so graphic. Please get that. When it says there in verse 13, the Lord saw her and felt compassion for her. He said, do not weep. The word used for compassion is this word from deep down in the belly, deep down in the guts, deep down in the visceral, the visceral, down in here when you get butterflies in your gut. 
Jesus, deep down in his gut, had such an emotional response to this woman that he said to her, stop weeping. Look at verse 14. And he came up and touched the coffin. And the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Wouldn't you like to have been there? <laughs> oh, man. I just, that, that just stuns me. Because I can see this poor lady. Can't you see this poor lady? And the sadness and sorrow of death. And just her, her circumstance. And the, and the text wants to emphasize that the Lord Jesus did not just indifferently say, okay, rise. He was motivated by deep emotional stirrings because he loved these people. Fascinating. Look at verse 14. He came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. He's talking to a dead guy. <laughs> and he rose. Look at 15. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And, look, and that would be enough. We get the point. What's the last phrase in that verse? Look at what it says. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Do you see that, how personal that is? It doesn't have to be in there. Jesus heals him, resurrects him, and delivers him. It's almost like a hand delivery. The Son of Man cares so much for the suffering, for the sufferer. Do you see what I'm trying to say? I hope so. I want to be like this. I want to see people like that. I want to be moved in the guts for those who are anguishing and suffering and, and so distressed like sheep without a shepherd. Not just Christians, not just people in our, in our body, but the world, you see. Yes, the world needs us, beloved. The world needs us to be like this. And what a time is this? The China virus has given us so many opportunities, hasn't it? Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. I've got five minutes. What am I going to do with five minutes, Timothy? Um, I know. I know. <laughs> the Apostle Paul. Just as someone who's touched by mercy, someone who has experienced the mercy of Christ, he says in 1 Timothy 1.13, he says this about himself. I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown, what? Mercy. I was shown mercy. The Apostle Paul was shown mercy. You know, you and I were shown mercy. Where was the greatest act of mercy ever shown? The cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the greatest expression of compassion, the greatest expression of mercy, is it not? Don't, become, don't, don't be so familiar with the cross and the gospel that it, it loses its stunningness. That on that cross... The perfect one who went around and did nothing but good for people. Jesus did nothing but show compassion. He did nothing but good for people. And now he's hanging on a cross. He's hanging on a cross as a common criminal. Hated by the people he came to show love to. And on that cross, he is suffering in our place. He is showing compassion by doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Remember, compassion is to enter into someone's misery and then to be moved to do something about it. Jesus Christ came. Not only did he enter into our suffering, but he could do something about it. And he went to the cross to do something about it. He went to the cross to pay for our sins. And on that cross, the father punished the son as though he was me. So that when I believed in his son, he would treat me as though I lived the life of Christ. And it's all of mercy. It's all of grace. It's compassion. Have you tasted of his compassion? Have you come to him seeking forgiveness and you have experienced his forgiveness? Have you come to him and experienced the mercy of Christ? 
Have you tasted of him and found him to be good? Then, you, then you're the one that needs to go into the world to tell them about it. Who else can tell of the mercy but the one who has experienced the mercy? So not only have you experienced the mercy, you've tasted the mercy, you are now being conformed to that mercy. And so our responsibility then is to go into the dark world where it's suffering to show the invisible Christ to them, yes? That's why, we, that's why we're here. When you go to your new building, wherever that is, yeah, that w- that's just a location where you all come on a Sunday to gather to worship this Christ like you're doing here. But when you scatter the rest of the week, it's to be, the, it's to be an extension of the, of the ministry of Christ and showing mercy to this world. Amen? Be intentional. Don't be indifferent. Don't be proud. Remember where the Lord has brought you so that you can enter into those places. Of course, sinners act like sinners. That's all they know how to do. Yeah? Pray for our government. (laughs) They need mercy. (laughs) They need mercy. Pray for them. Amen? Apostle Paul would say even in like Romans 10, I wish myself accursed for the sake of my brethren. Man, I'm not there yet, but I want to be. I wish myself accursed for the sake of my brethren. Amen, brothers? Amen. Yeah, there's no. I trust that the Lord has shown himself to be merciful. I hope that you've seen from the Old Testament to the New that there's nothing new when we say that God is compassionate and slow to anger. And I hope that I've been able to encourage you and exhort you that not only are you being conformed to this very image of compassion, you're to go out and to show this compassion. You're to show this Christ-like mercy. And then you die and go to glory. That's it. That's what we do. So let's look to Christ. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. I ask that you would apply this to our hearts. And any deficiency in me, Father, in presenting this, may you fill it up and use it for your perfect will. I thank you for my dear friends here. May you bless this place. Continue to bless this place, Father. Strengthen them, and may the glory of Christ radiate from their lives. And we'll give you all the praise for your worthy in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.